I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. I want to introduce um, the basic concept of equilibrium in polyprotic or multiple proton systems. So in a sense, acid-base type equilibria, uh, the transfer of protons, but one that has more than one proton. So we often in introductory chemistry talk about strong acids and bases where strong acids give off a single proton, something like HCl, something like nitric acid, uh, HNO3, et cetera. Today we're gonna uh, start with looking at one that we, once we introduce those strong acids, we often move on to, to ones that have multiple um, systems. And I've, I've given a list of, of some of these acids here, probably phosphoric is the one uh, you see most commonly, where it's not just a single proton it can lose. It, can, it starts as say H3PO4, phosphoric acid. It can lose one of those protons of one of the oxygens, uh, and that's nearly a strong acid, but then it can lose the second one and even the third one. And each one of those has a different acid constant or equilibrium associated with it. Usually the first one, uh, May, causes a fairly acidic proton, and then it, they get weaker and weaker and have different pKa's associated with them. And so, for example, the list on the bottom shows ones that have, you know, a second proton, which we would just label the uh, pKa2, and then if it has a third, three, et cetera. So, uh, and the first, and you'll see if it had two, you would first equilibrate, you would uh, lose the first one and then the second equilibrium constant to the second one. So you could write it as two separate equilibrium equations. So again, the one we see most commonly in introductory chemistry, just to remind us, is something like phosphoric acid, where it can lose one proton uh, in equilibrium, which would be the Ka for this one, where uh, we define it as the reactants on top over the products, and then we can lose the second proton to two to H2, and then finally down to H1, et cetera. So where you end up with a bare uh, PO4 anion, minus three anion, with three protons, um, acidic protons in solution. And each one of those has its own equilibrium associated with it. So, and we can, you know, by determining the concentration of each of these um, uh, different compounds in solution, by measuring the pH, by looking at how much uh, H3PO4, H2PO4 minus there is, et cetera, we can get uh, what the uh, equilibrium constant is. We often express that as a pKa, or minus the log of the equilibrium, because uh, then it varies on a scale like pH that we're used to. And so we can see, again, the first one is fairly acidic with a, a pKa of two. Uh, and then the second one, you have to go much closer to neutral pH, and then even the third one is, is in the basic regime. So, and, and it defines the, the K for each of them. So, um, for example, if you have a, um, you know, what's the pH of a, of a 10 millimolar solution of phosphoric acid it's the, in water, you can see that, I mean, really the, the, the acidity is, is mainly defined by the first one. And so, you know, to first approximation, you can say the pH is just looking at the equilibrium of, of pKa1. And we can approximate that by saying, you know, that um, there's going to be equal amounts of H2PO4 minus and proton because of the top equilibrium. So you can just take that as uh, the proton concentration squared. And then the bottom is, is 10 millimolar minus uh, that concentration, and so we can use that uh, in a quadratic formula to uh, determine what the overall pH. Now, to get a little more accurate, you should take into account the equilibrium of the next two as well, but they're far enough away. You can see they're gonna only add very slightly to the acidity of it. So yes, it gets you a little bit more accurate, but we're really talking about you know uh, tenths or hundreds of, of a pH unit that really changes by these equilibrium constants that are um, you know, so uh, far away that, that have such a higher value in this case. So, so it's approximated by just considering the equilibrium of the one. So 
I introduced that, these polyprotic systems, to get to something in biological thermodynamics that's of you know, key importance, which is of the major class of biological systems or you know, compounds we look at, we often look at sugars, so we look at carbohydrates and uh, glycosylation and, and things related to, to that. Those are a major class of system. We look at nucleic acids. Uh, we often think of this as genetics and, and RNA, DNA, etc. Those, and we look at amino acids, uh, which make peptides, proteins, etc. All of them have associated equilibrium and oftentimes uh, polyprotic in nature. We're going to look at one specifically today, uh, which is our amino acids that we use to make up peptides and proteins, etc. So amino acids, as implied by the name, have an amino group, an NH2, NH3, which itself is uh, polyprotic. And the acid group, which is acid, which is a carboxylic acid, which again is a, uh, has an acidic proton associated with it. When you have ones where uh, they have both a acid group, which we think of as uh, if you remove the proton is negatively charged, an amino group when you add a proton to an NH2 to make it NH3 plus is positively charged. We call that double ion charge a switter ion, and so. Amino acids are switter ions, and they are polyprotic in, in nature. And the general uh, rule is shown here where in most physiological pHs, it is a switter ion with an NH3 plus and a C double bond OO minus. In other words, it's deprotonated on the acid and it's protonated on the amine side of things over a fairly large pH range. And this is a general diagram for all amino acids. And of course it'll differ. Some amino acids themselves have an additional R group that has an exchangeable or an acid-based proton on it as well. It also shows we have to blow it up times 10 to the eighth to see the neutral species here. So yes, all of these things are in equilibrium, but oftentimes it's, a, it's 10 to the eighth smaller uh, than the switter ion component. So it can often be um, negligible. The other thing that's shown here is just for all of these, there are a, a carboxylic acid group and an amine group, and they have roughly, they change depending on what the R group or what the amino acid is, but you know, roughly they have similar pKa's for where you dissociate the uh, proton off of the acid group. Um, at, uh, you can see at low pH here, and where you, um, you, you, be, you lose the, the proton on your uh, NH3 to, to go to NH2 at, at much higher pH, shown here. So that's a general diagram. We can look at something specific, uh, in this case like lysine, which not only has the amino acid group, but it also has uh, an NH2 or another uh, amino group, uh, amine group on its, um, it, you know, as part of the R group for, for lysine. Uh, and so that gives an additional pKa as well. And so, and, and you can see the specific values uh, for lysine in this case. You should be, uh, become familiar with this with all the amino acids and where their general pKa's are. While you'll be given tables, being able to calculate very precisely by setting up the equilibrium for all the different components and being able to, to look at this is something uh, that's fundamental in, in biological thermodynamics and, and begins our conversation of setting up equilibrium. So I hope this basic introduction helps. It'll be followed up with some specific examples, both in your book and in screencasts. Thank you.